The last unit of this lecture is on neural machine translation, which is maybe one of the landmark applications of neural language models. And this is a paper that came out at NeurIPS 2014 from Ilya Setskiver et al. Sequence to sequence learning with neural networks. And what they proposed is a very simple end-to-end -end trainable model for machine translation that shocked the community because it was the first paper to produce results that outperformed all of the previously developed hand-engineered rule-based systems for machine translation. And the key behind this was basically just a very well-engineered but simple model in combination with a lot of compute and a lot of data like one of the one of the main insights of many of the deep learning um, successes in other fields as well if you have enough data if you have the right model and if you have enough compute you can deep learning can do amazing things so what they did is they used four layer we talked about this recurrent neural networks with layers in the last lecture. So we used four layer LSTMs for encoding and decoding the source or target sentence respectively, where encoding operates in reverse order of the input sentence. Let's assume we want to translate a sentence from English to French, then we reverse the order of the input sentence. And this is advantageous because it introduces short-term dependencies because we end with the first word and then the decoder starts to decode um, with the first word in the target language. And by reversing the input sentence, you get uh, shorter dependencies because the, the first word in the input sentence is likely related to earlier words in the output sentence. But otherwise is a simple LSTM. So here's an LSTM that pr processes these reverse ordered words, uh, word by word. So the words are embedded in a word, a distributed word representation, and there's a hidden state that is carried forward through this recurrent neural network. And then there's an intermediate representation that's called a thought vector. This is the, the representation that stores the meaning of that sentence that shall be translated. So once we reach the end of symbol, end of sentence symbol, we produce, we have the thought vector as the hidden representation. It's a global representation of the input sentence. And then that thought vector is decoded. And the reason why we have this interface of the thought vector is that the input sentence and the output sentence may, may have a different length. And also the word order is very different in different languages, depending on the grammar of these languages. So we create a global representation of the input sentence, the thought vector that is passed to decoder. And it has long been believed in the community that such a, a simple system cannot work because it's impossible People have claimed it's impossible to generate a thought vector, a global representation of a sentence that captures enough to, decon to decode it well in the target language. But then this was the first paper that demonstrated that this is possible, surpassing all of the existing techniques that have been developed so far. So they used a wording embedding of 1000 dimensions and the decoding was done via beam search, which we're gonna have a, a short look at in a minute. It was the first end-to-end -end system that outperformed all of the state-of-the-art models and was also the first system that demonstrated that this is really possible at large scale and that led to deployment. So that was the time then in 2015 when, for instance, Google um, completely transitioned to neural from the traditional language translation models they had to neural machine translation models in 2015. So how 
let's talk about decoding. Um, how can we do decoding? Well, let w1 to wt denote the target sentence and let v denote this thought vector that we have here in red. Then sampling a translation from the LSTM decoder is really simple because we have this autoregressive nature that we can just uh, sample a new word from the distribution that is uh, predicted by the LSTM given the thought vector and the previous words. Um, where the previous words are summarized in this hidden state in the case of an LSTM. But this is not what we want to do in, in translation. What we want to do is we want to compute the most probable translation for an input sentence. Or in other words, we want to find w1 to wt that maximizes p of w1 to wt given the thought vector v. Now, this is very costly because there's a large there's a large number of possibilities for possible translations. So searching that exhaustively is intractable. But a, a greedy algorithm might actually work well, and it often does in practice. And a greedy algorithm is one which basically word by word finds the best word that maximizes the probability up to that word. So we take argmax over only wt if we compute the next word t given v and all the previous words before the word t. So this is called a greedy algorithm. It's important to note that these two are not the same. They don't lead to the same result, but the greedy algorithm is often a good approximation. So here's an example of a failure case of a greedy algorithm. Let's consider the sentence, apples are good, and the sentence, those apples are good. Those apples are good. <laughs> the probability of apples are good in a training corpora might be larger than the probability of those apples are good because apples are good occurs more frequently. However, there is more sentences in the training corpora that start with those compared to apples. So the probability of the sentence those, like the partial sentence those, is bigger than the probability of the partial sentence apples, the sentences that start with apples. So if we do greedy decoding, then we would start with those, even though the probability of apples is, uh, the probability of apples are good is bigger than the probability of those apples are good. And this is where beam search comes in. Beam search is somewhere in between. It's it's better than a gre purely greedy algorithm, but it's still only an approximation to the true. Um, a solution that searches over the entire search space. And the idea of beam search, and that's also what is done in this paper for decoding, is that at each time step we maintain a list of the k-best words, where k is a hyperparameter of beam search. And we keep a list of these k-best words and the best or the corresponding hidden vectors. And this can be used then to produce a list of k-best decodings for the following word. So for, for all of these k best words with the hidden vectors, we can look at all possible next words and multiply the probabilities and then find the best combination and then just get a list of, like a sorted list of these best combinations and shorten that list again to k for the next step and so forth. And so this is why it's called beam search. We, keep a, we always keep a beam of, of k solutions. And, and through that, we can come up with better solutions compared to naive greedy search, where we're still just doing an approximation and it's still tractable. Now here's an illustration. There's also the website where you can find uh, a little bit more explanation, but it's, it's very simple. We start here with an empty uh, sequence, and then we have A, B, C, D, E as candidates, and A and C are most likely, so we with a beam of size two, we, we keep track of A and C, and then for A, B is most likely, and for C, E is most likely. Um, and then we, we continue A, B, and C, E. So we maintain this short, always this short list of two hypotheses. And it could of course also be the case that here, A, B, and A, C are both more likely than C, E, in which case we would continue with A, B, and A, C here.
Now, this was a big step. The paper that I mentioned before made a big step and it led industry to change the algorithms that we were using in practice. So it, it meant really that it started working. Neural machine translation started to have an impact in practice. But then in 2017, there was another big step and that was the transformer paper that completely changed the architecture of previous neural machine translation models into a purely attention-based architecture. So the transformer is an, an attention-based model, and we'll come to that, which doesn't rely on recurrency or convolutions. There's no RNN or no convolutional layers in the model I'm gonna show you. It's just an attention-based model. And the advantage of an attention-based model over a RNN, for instance, is that there is no sequential dependencies. You don't need to wait uh, for the previous words to be computed until you can compute the probability for the current word. But all the tokens can be processed in parallel. And it's advantageous because now nowadays um, all, all the computational gains are through parallelism. And so we want to have our models also as parallelizable as possible in order to take advantage of the massively parallel hardware that's available today. So that leads to significant speed ups when using modern GPU clusters. And that's what, what this paper exploited. This is also a, a paper from Google. Self-attention is what has been used in the transformer. And self-attention relates all the tokens, all the words in a layer with each other. Which means not only that this can be computed in parallel, but it also means that it can more easily capture long distance dependencies compared to an RNN where these long distance dependencies have to be carried over the time steps through the hidden state with all these problems of managing gradients. Here we're doing parallel processing and uh, um, therefore we can, we can directly relate any element to each other in the sentence. And transformer-like architectures have now replaced RNNs in NLP applications almost entirely. They are de, de facto standard for all state-of-the-art models. For instance, on the Superglue benchmark, which is one of these standard benchmarks to evaluate um, machine translation performance. So let's have a, a bit more closer look into what the transformer does. Each layer in a transformer has a shape of L, where we use L for layer. This is Einstein notation now that I'm using. L of T and J, where T ranges over the position in the input sequence and J ranges over the neurons at that position. This is basically a matrix, where for each position, for each word, we have a vector, a word embedding. And when processing sentences of words, T is the sequence length. So this is basically the same shape as in an RNN. It's a sequence of vectors. So here we have a sequence of vectors. Little t, big J is a vector. However, unlike in RNNs, in the transformer, we can compute the layer, the next layer, L plus one, from the previous layer completely in Perl. That's what I mentioned before. So we, we go from one tensor to the next tensor completely in parallel without the sequential um, relationships. So in this respect, the transformer is actually more similar to a CNN than to an RNN, but it's different from a CNN because it has a tension and it doesn't do convolutions. The fundamental innovation of the transformer is the self-attention layer. For each position a T in the sequence, we compute an attention over the other positions in the sequence. We'll make this more formal on the next slide. And then the transformer uses multiple heads. So initially we tried with a single head, but then they, they split up the computation into multiple heads because um, this gave them empirical benefits. So there's eight different heads in the original implementation, um, each of which computes its own attention operation. It's not very well described in the paper why they use multiple heads, but it just empirically works better. 
than just using a single of these attention heads. And then the self-attention is constructed, um, uh, co constructs a tensor, we call it A for attention, with indices K, T1 and T2, which specifies for, K, for head K, in the case the head index from one to eight, the strength of the attention weight from T1 to T2. So the attention that T1 pays to T2, that word T1 pays to T2, in a particular layer of the transformer for a particular head K. So that's very abstract, but we'll make it more formal. And in the paper, they used an embedding dimension for each word. There's a word embedding dimension of 512. Token means word. So this is a word model. So per token, 512 dimension. And they use eight hats. So um, that they used then, because we have eight heads, they used for the query and the keys and the values that this attention, self-attention layer utilizes, they use 64 dimensions. 64 times eight is 512. So we break the problem from 512, they do computations at 64 dimensions, but they do it eight times and then they concatenate again to get 512. In fact, they concatenate and, and they do a fully connected layer. So they could use a different intermediate dimension, but they wanted to keep it comparable. So they used exactly 512 divided by eight. And this query key and value embeddings are um, properties of this, or values of the self-attention layer that we're gonna talk about. So this is the transformer on one slide in terms of equation. This is the self it's not exactly correct. It's a self-attention layer. The transformer has multiple layers, but one of these layers, the most complex one, is the self-attention layer, the multi-headed self-attention layer. And this is what is on this slide. So for each head K and each position for each word in a sequence, we compute a key, query, and value vector. These are the 64-dimensional vectors. And the queries we call Q, the keys we call K, and these are used to compute the self-attention matrix A for that hat. And then A, this attention matrix, is multiplied with the values B to yield embedding vectors H that are then concatenated. These are the 64 times 8. They concatenate 8 of them. And they are then multiplied with a, with a, a matrix to yield the output of that layer. And so this is what it looks like in Einstein notation. So we have, so, so we start at the bottom where we have just word and words represented maybe as um, one hot vectors or word embeddings of one hot vectors. <clears throat> so we have some word embeddings of these one hot vectors and um, we multiply these, so this is at time step t, we have a vector, this j is all of the elements of that vector. And we multiply this at layer, at the first layer with a matrix w, wq, um, to get a query vector. Um, so this, is, this runs over i, so I, have, I could have used capital I's here um, as well. Right, so we have we have this, this query vector we have for hat k at time step t and that runs over i and this is 64 dimensional. So we go from 512 dimensional j to 64 dimensional i using this matrix multiplication. And we have different matrices, three different matrices, one for the so-called query, one for the key and one for the value. So we get query, key and value vectors of 64 dimensions for each head and for each word. And then um, we multiply the query and the key. If they are similar, then this leads to a strong activation of the attention matrix A. And there's some normalization factor here as well. And then we do a softmax over T2. So this is basically here, you can see this goes over T1 for Q and 
t2 for k and so we get this matrix of t1 attends to t2 relationships here for k for head k and it's over all the this is a vector multiplication it's over all the elements of these uh, query and key vectors and then the softmax to normalize and so then we have this attention matrix and we multiply this attention matrix to um, the value value vector v where we now sum over the t dimension of this vector v and the t2 dimension of this matrix a this is how t1 attends to t2 right at time t so we get these 64 dimensional vectors h which we then concatenate so this is here over the different heads so we have head zero up to head k minus one so we concatenate them and then we we compute a matrix product in order to get the output of that layer and that's it we com in summary we compute queries we compute keys and we compute values for each head and for each time step or word and then from the queries and keys we compute attention and that attention is multiplied with the values so we extract we take the values where the model attends to and these are then concatenated and fed to the next layer and here's an illustration of this there's multiple illustrations that we'll find on the internet this is one that i find, think is quite intuitive there's the the web link as well now in order to use this what, what i've just described is just this self-attention layer there's additional layers there's some feed forward layers there's some normalization layers but this is really the core of the transformer and now if you want to use this for for translation you will have a sequence of input words that are going to be encoded here on the left you can see the encoder and then information from this encoder is given to the decoder in particular the um, key and the queries are given to the decoder and the, they are combined with the values of um, each word in sequence encoded through this encoder that's part of the decoder <laughs> so there's a, there's an output sentence here that's successively established through this decoder by combining keys and queries from the encoder with values from this decoder and this decoder always predicts the next word and now there's some tricks here um, for instance uh, in order to make sure that this decoder doesn't attend to words in the future because it shall only produce one word at a time um, like weights in the future are masked out for instance so here's a little illustration of how this works so this is the encoder on the left there's a translation problem we have a french input sentence and then uh, English output sentence and so the, the French input sentence is encoded using this stack of there's six of these transformer layers and then the features are, are the, um, um, these, these keys and the values are then basically the passed to the decoder and then uh, a query by the decoder so it's actually the keys and the values are passed from the encoder to the decoder and then the query combined with the queries of the decoder not the keys and the queries so step by step we produce the output sentence then end of sentence so here's an illustration of what this attention looks like so we have a sentence here and we have the word making and we can see for these eight different attention heads shown in rows here what they attend to is illustrated with uh, stronger colors you can see that making attends to more difficult more than it attends to other words so the model has captured that there is a relationship between these two words now if you look at the state of the art in machine translation um, this is the benchmark to look at. This is the so-called superglue benchmark. You can see a whole bunch of models here that get better and better over time. 
achieving performance that people thought previously was impossible. And um, all of the state-of-the-art models use transformer architecture in one or the other way. They all differ in terms of the details and in terms of how training is done and the data sets and the hardware, but they're all building on top of similar ideas. Maybe you have heard of GPT-2. GPT-2 is a model from OpenAI, which is basically also just a transform model that they combine with unsupervised pre-training. So we first pre-trained unsupervised on very large text programs with extremely large hardware and then supervised fine tuning. And they proposed this application of zero shot learning where the task that is given to the model at inference time after the model has been trained is to continue from a prompt. So you give the model a sequence of words and ask it to continue from there. And there's a couple of, of great examples that you can find on the OpenAI website. And this was really this was really surprising to many how well this could work. People started to believe that AI is possible and then they saw this first. So here's an example. They gave us an input um, the following. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. And now this is the uh, continuation of the machine. This is the machine talking. The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn of its unicorn. unicorn. These four-horned silver-white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is now finally solved. Dr. George Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz and several companions were exploring the Andes mountain when Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. While examining these bizarre creatures, the scientists discovered that the creatures also spoke some fairly regular English. Perez stated, we can see, for example, that they have a common language, something like a dialect or dialectic. Dr. Perez believes that the unicorns may have originated in Argentina. Some believe that perhaps the creatures were created when a human and a unicorn met each other in a time before human civilization. However, Perez also pointed out that it is likely that the only way of knowing for sure if unicorns are indeed the descendants of a lost alien race is through DNA. Well, this was really shocking to many <laughs> that something like this was possible. And then GPT-3 is now the newest incarnation of this system. Um, and uh, there, there was this famous case of a blogger, an undergrad that got access to the system and, and queried the system um, with very simple queries and then put the results out as a, as a blog post. Um, and that blog post got a lot of press and got a lot of um, comments and people didn't realize that that blog post was written entirely by a machine. Um, so here's, here's the input. The prompt is feeling unproductive. Maybe you should stop overthinking. And this is what the machine says or produced. In order to get something done, maybe we need to think less. Seems counterintuitive, but I believe sometimes our thoughts can get in the way of the creative process. We can work better at times when we tune out the external world and focus on what's in front of us. I've been thinking about this lately, so I thought it would be good to write an article about it. So what exactly does this mean? Let's start with some definitions. Definition one, creative thinking. CT is the act of using your mind to come up with ideas that are not already present in reality or that have never existed before. It is a form of mental activity that involves the use of logic and reason. Definition two, overthinking, OT, is the act of trying to come up with ideas that have already been thought through by someone else. OT usually results in ideas that are impractical, impossible, or even stupid, and it goes on. 
so this was really impressive and uh but but there um there's also some downsides to these to these models that i'd like to mention here and there's there's several critiques and i picked out two um so one problem with these models is that this is not the models you you might want to train at home gpt2 has 1.5 billion parameters this was already uh, a huge amount of parameters at the time GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters, more than two orders of magnitude more than the previous model. So these are just these are models that that really can just be trained in an industrial setting, and they are not fully open source. So um, uh, it's not exactly clear what will happen to these models. And there's several critiques centered around these. One critique is by Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. Um, you can look at this article in MIT Technology Review. OpenAI's language generator has no idea what it's talking about. And they have, they have shown if you query that model with something that it, it doesn't feel comfortable with, it, it's hard for the model to, it becomes very quickly clear that the model has no idea what it's talking about. It's easy for the model to produce output like this, um, but it's hard, uh, harder in other subjects and you can very quickly come to a point where it's clear that um, the model is not, not thinking as, as humans would. And then another critique, um, which is a critique in general to deep learning, but it has been um, uh, emphasize that it's particularly problematic for these huge language models with millions of parameters and a uh, very large compute clash that's needed is the, the carbon footprint that is um, uh, left when training these models. And it's not only training these models once, but you have to, these models have been trained by searching for their hyperparameters. They have been trained many, many times um, leading to uh, large carbon emissions. So there's also an article on this and I um, hope you enjoy reading them and I um, will finish with this. Thanks.